That's Enough Out of You podcast is sponsored by Todd John's Law. Unfortunately, bad things happen to good people, whether it's the result of an auto accident caused by the carelessness of another driver or being charged with a crime. Dealing with the aftermath of a personal injury accident or being involved with the criminal justice system can be extremely difficult. That's why, whatever you're facing, you should never go it alone. You need an experienced attorney who will stand by you every step of the way. Todd is experienced, licensed, trusted, respected, and guaranteed. No one will work harder or more diligently on your behalf, and he will personally handle your case from beginning to end. Located on Drinker Street in Dunmore, Pennsylvania, Todd has been representing the legal rights of Scranton and Wilkesbury personal injury victims and those accused of a crime for over 20 years. At Todd John's Law, the utmost priority is ensuring that your rights are always protected and that your case is resolved as quickly and fairly as possible so that you can move on with your life. Call Todd John's Law at 570-876-6903. With Todd John's Law, you will receive equal justice under the law. All right, all right, and welcome to That's Enough Out of You, the weekly podcast where we talk about, I don't know, we talk about a lot of different kinds of things. Uh, lots of topics, uh, and I don't do it alone. I have a co-host with me that helps me out quite a bit, and his name is Sean Kane. Sean, what's going on, buddy? Hey, Billy Raids, how you doing, buddy? I'm doing pretty good today for a, for a disgusting, uh, rainy, horrible weekend that we've had. Yeah, the whole weekend's a washout, buddy. Terrible, but um, we did manage somehow to get a soccer game in. My son's soccer team played yesterday in the pouring rain. And fortunately for me, I am a coach on the team, so I was able to sneak underneath the tent that the coaches put up so I didn't have to sit out in the pouring rain the whole time. But uh, the kids had a blast, and hey. What yeah, we had, we had a teener ball uh, baseball game canceled today, so. Yeah. Anyhow, um. We have uh, with us today a great guest that we are so excited to to have on. Uh, we were on his show uh, a few weeks ago and uh, talking about Bruce de Torres. Bruce is the author of God's School, 9-11 and JFK, The Lies That Are Killing Us and The Truth That Sets Us Free. And he is the host of World Stage on TNT Radio. And Bruce joins us uh, right now. How you doing, Bruce? I'm really well. Great to be with you both. Happy whatever day it is. <laughs> yeah. It's actually it's Yom Kippur, I think, today, right? Or tomorrow. So for those who celebrate. Um, so we have uh, quite a bit to talk to you about today, Bruce. Um, Sean, I know you want to get things kicked off and we'll we'll kind of get into the, the list of topics that we have for Bruce. Yeah, let's get into it. Uh, Bruce, thank you so much for coming on, buddy. This this is going to be fantastic. I mean, we you had us on your show, and we want to return the favor. And uh, first thing we want to talk about, Bruce, is let's talk about your book, God's School, 9-11, and JFK. Um, why did you end up writing it? What was the reasons for it? And uh, why is that book so important? I was compelled. I had already researched energy and consciousness and the, and the nature of reality for a number of years and put it in a drawer. And then in 2004, I started studying 9-11 because I was advised to and had my mind blown. And about 10 years later, I was studying President Kennedy's assassination because I was going on stage every Wednesday night at a little divey bar in Atlanta that had open mic and in between singers and songwriters they would let people do spoken word and i got up there and for years i lectured and taught this nearly empty room (laughs) about 9-11 and about the federal reserve and about all the horrors behind the scenes that i was studying for my own fascination i i i wasn't thinking of putting it in a book until 2013 when I did seven Wednesdays in a row teaching about the Kennedy assassination. 
and then just kept studying John F. Kennedy because I discovered his greatness. And I, I was just absolutely blown away how recent that was to me because I was born in 1961 and I was inflamed about how little properly understood he really was. So in 2014, I got the idea, I'm going to wrap all these nightmarish realities about how the world really works and how corrupt and criminal our government really is in my nice airy fairy new agey lovey dovey thoughts about thoughts become things and there's only one of us here and I, and I hate that i go right into my mocking tone because these are the ideas that make life worth living for me spoiler alert they make life worth living for western civilization because you can find them excuse me for all civilizations because they are in the orient they're in the asian writings they're in the upanishads the bhagavad Gita. All the Zen, all the Zen stuff discovers, and this is what gets passed down through Plato, and then the Gospels, and Marianne Williamson, and the Persian poet Rumi, and Khalil Gibran, and that's the good news. The truth that sets us free is that there's only one of us here. This is something of an illusion. Near-death experiencers report to us: this is not reality. This is some kind of game or illusion, and that's. What can make us fearless? In a nutshell, it's the power that comes from transcending the fear of death. All in about 200 pages. That's why my book is important. That's good stuff, Bruce. I, I mean, let's get into some of the things you said there. Very important. Uh, JFK, the, the, the greatness of Kennedy. I think a lot of people really just misunderstand who this man was in I think, of course, a lot of it has to do with the character assassination uh, that we talk about a lot on our podcast, and I know you do as well. Um, but but talk about, you know, the greatness of, of John Kennedy, because I think a lot of people misunderstand, you know, when you hear people say, well, he was only president for two years and 10 months. He really didn't accomplish a lot. And that is such hogwash. Like when we look at what he's accomplished, uh, the, the go through the documents. I mean, it's amazing. This man has done did more in two two years and 10 months. Than, than some most presidents did in eight years in office. So talk to me about the greatness of John Kennedy. Yeah, it's apparent when you read accounts of his life and presidency from that time, when you read the commentary from people who were alive and adults back then, it was obvious to the, to the vast majority of Americans by the time he, he died and then who lived through the next few years, what we had just lost. OK, it was obvious oral histories of the people who worked in his presidency. They were classic kind of comment. He assembled what was later disparaged as the, the, the best and the brightest. And when they served him, we had a very competent government presidency and administration. When they served Lyndon Johnson, loyally, according to his perverse, disgusting, psychopathic, murderous, abusive, manipulative agendas and neuroses and psychoses they uh, en engulfed us in the quagmire of vietnam and a lot of other horrendous things but what they said about kennedy was he was always the calmest coolest most informed and objective one among us okay and then after about 10 years or so less than 10 years of agitation about the Problems with the official government story, the Warren Commission version of what happened is assassination. By the early 70s, there were real rumblings about reinvestigating his uh, assassination. And definitely by the mid 70s. And that's where, like you mentioned, a cottage industry of disparagement of new stories coming out about what a drug user he was and what a, we'll talk about the realities of it, but just overblown, but especially his his womanizing made him sound like he barely had he wouldn't have time to eat or sleep or be president if he did the womanizing that he's been accused of since the 1970s. Sharing a girlfriend with the mob, trading secrets and envelopes with right. Sam Giancana. Like you said, <laughs> all the all the character assassination, accusing right. his brother of being there when Marilyn Monroe died. Since the 1970s, that has buried the reality of 
of his greatness. I'll let you interject or just keep yelling at you here. Well, no, you're 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 on to some, Bruce, because you know we had Don McGovern on, and Don McGovern just destroys all that that lies about Marilyn Monroe and the Kennedys, and you know Bobby being there the day the day that she died, and all this other nonsense. And it's just you know it's it's the the like you said, it covers up the greatness of Kennedy because they they make him out to be like a rock star, like he he's playing a concert and then he's got you know thirty five girls lined up at his door afterwards. I mean, it's just nonsense. The man, this is a busy man who's accomplished so much in his life. You know, he, he wouldn't have time to be involved in the nonsense that, that they put out there. But another thing you touched on is, is you know, the difference between John Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson and the way they interacted with uh, a lot of the people who stayed on, like, say, McGeorge Bundy and uh, Robert McNamara. But there was such a difference between the two men as far as, you know, with Kennedy, he would like to hear from all his advisors. He would listen to everything they said, take in the, everything they said. Where Lyndon Johnson, it was his way or the highway. And that was it, you know, and he didn't want to hear, you know, what, what somebody else, he, he would isolate somebody who disagreed with him. And of course, you know, one of the myths of, of academia is that, you know, Johnson was just following JFK's policies and there really wasn't a difference between the two men. And that is such complete garbage. Johnson basically reverses almost every single one of JFK's policies, except for civil rights, who I think the, the civil rights bill that Johnson gets way too much credit. I mean, Bobby Kennedy deserves a lot of credit. That's the only reason he stayed on to get that passed. And, and of course, we talked about this with Monica Wiesak, that, you know, the civil rights bill, the only reason Kennedy didn't introduce that earlier is because he knew that thing was going to get filibustered to death. And he went around that through the court system, you know, um, through executive orders. And, and that, you know, that was the difference. He wasn't slow on civil rights. He was very progressive on civil rights right from the day he was inaugurated. Mm -hmm. You know, so mm -hmm. just the difference between Kennedy and Johnson, you know, that's something that academia really just does a disservice. And, and kid, go ahead, Bill. Yeah, I was just going to say, Bruce, you know, kids don't really learn about JFK anymore. They, they, it, you know, it may be like a paragraph in their history. If they even have a history book, it may be like a paragraph of, you know, he was president, he was elected president in 1960. He was assassinated by Lee Harvey Oswald in 1963. Um, end of story. You know, they don't really get the, they don't, nobody really gets the picture anymore, the full picture of who he was, what he meant and, and why his, his assassination and his loss was so disastrous and why we we feel the effects of it today. You know, we Sean mentioned we talked to Monica uh, Wiesak, I think it was last week, a couple of weeks ago, and she really gave us um a lot of detail that you don't you don't hear a lot about things that he did, you know, outside of of you know some of the policies that that people talk about all the time, you know, Cuba and Russia and, and that's kind of things. When you know his 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 policy on uh the environment, his policy on um, you know, on, on health, um, wanting to, you know, wanting children to be, to eat healthy. Right. Um, uh, I mean, when was the last time we had a president who cared about how children, you know, the health of, of our children and how they ate? I mean, he basically cared about people. He cared about people. And that just, we don't see that. Not only do we not see that from our presidents anymore, but we don't really see that from any politician. And, and and it was on a global level. It wasn't just you know about America. Sure, he wanted to make the entire world a better place. Yeah. Oh, uh, de definitely. Did Monica write the last president? Yes, she did. Okay, just double checking my memory banks there. Um, Kennedy is buried because we live in a national security state. We're not a nice little constitutional republic anymore. Although we pretend to be very much like Frank Zappa told us in the 1980s, they're going to maintain the facade of democracy for as long as it's worth it. But when it really doesn't become worth it, they'll pull back the curtain, roll up the scenery. You'll see the bare brick walls of the tyranny for what it really, really is. And we're approaching that state. And Kennedy's goodness and caring about people comes from the family. Joseph P. And his, and his mother, Rose, raised nine kids. A couple died early. One was institutionalized in a horrific uh, medical uh, situation. But the ethos and the ethic of the family truly was that the father, Joseph P., 
loved and was great at business and making money. And he basically rewarded his kids if they would do do well, he would take care of them financially. But it was ingrained in them public service. Also, he probably had a complex of proving himself as a better American than Native Americans because of the prejudice against Irish still in Boston when he was when he was being raised. They were yes. exemplary public citizens from the, from the street level on up. So it really was in the DNA of of the competitive nature for the father's approval being a good person and being being a good person in that family seemed to be the equivalent of being a good citizen and caring about others and maybe they inspired stanley and spider-man you know to whom much is given much is expected because right. they have paid back that in spades those who could be civic minded who didn't have their human foibles and ski accidents and drug addictions and drug overdoses and other problems that attack any big family um but back to this of course yeah bruce i just want to inject one thing of course you know joseph p kennedy of course he gets attacked in the media as well you know and we had jim diagenio on and he addressed you know the, the mafia ties to to joe kennedy which is which is nonsense and he really ripped that apart and all the stuff about you know the, mm. the myth and the lie that you know the mafia rigged the election for john kennedy which from from my standpoint somebody who's who's I consider myself an expert on organized crime. I mean, that's laughable to think that the mafia would help the Kennedys who were attacking them for years and then help to help John Kennedy get elected. That's, that's such a joke. And, and but, you, know, you know, some people, say, some people say that Sean, as if it's, as if it's fact, as if it's, you oh, know, I know just Absolutely. Known by everybody. Oh yeah. You know, the Chicago mob helped, helped get Kennedy elected. I mean, that's, that's insane to just say that. And, and, you know what going and and I'm sorry to keep to go back to this um well I'm not sorry I I'm, I want to go back to this just to to interject something else that um you know I think one of the things that that made Kennedy so unique was the fact that he was actually in combat he fought in you know and was in was injured great point and I think that gave him a unique perspective that no president since has had which is to see the horrors of war, war. The, yeah. the the death and the destruction and the uh, unbelievable uh, just, you know, toll that it can take on, on even people that, that survive uh, because he was one of them. And, and, you know, not only uh, mentally, but physically. And I think he, he understood that, Hey, I don't ever want anybody to have to go through that. And I'm not, you know, I'm going to make sure I'm going to do whatever I can to make sure that we don't get involved in in any kind of a conflict, any kind of a war, and and the, there's and the low the low grade kind of lieutenant or officer that he was there. They they majored in griping about the big decisions of the big brass and the nonsensical mm -hmm. you know military stuff. So he was confronted with that immediately with the with the Bay of Pigs. But Bill, more to your point about the combat that he saw, the dangers that he faced, the um his own life almost lost in the PT-109 incident is inside a lifetime of struggling to survive against his health and medical issues. So yes. here's the, here's the joyful news to study John F. Kennedy is to study a character of mythical proportions, like the Odyssey and the Iliad, these big, huge classic stories Moby Dick, where you and I as regular humans can be so blown away by the size of the man's decisions, commitments, priorities. He lived ideals. Getting to this point, Bill, once we overcome our fear of death, we are unstoppable and we are a force of, to be reckoned with yeah. at every level. And Kennedy literally told his people around him, confidants, close confidants, the confidants, the trick is to live each life as if it may be your last. So he was no idiot. He knew he was confronting the CIA, the Pentagon, big military industries, forces that kill to win. He knew that he had his hands on the steering wheel of this enormous ship that Eisenhower well described as the military industrial complex. Right. And he took the tiny steering wheel and he turned it all the way and he pinned it to a full reverse. Yeah. The rudder turned. 
But for years, it's huge and it's going in a certain direction. It's going to turn. It's going to take time. But he was turning it. And he knew every day he could catch a bullet. But he did the right thing because it was the right thing, even if folks just get profiles in courage. Now, to, con to continue the joy of reading about him, contrasting him to Johnson, Sean, if Kennedy is the heroic figure, and he certainly was, Johnson is an equally big, horrific, complicated, hilarious, surprising, sniveling, disgusting <laughs> version of all the things that are, dis of many things that are disgusting Absolutely. in us. Yeah. And for you and I to live a life worth living, we have to examine our life. Thank you, Socrates. And see, how did anyone do anything? And how did this come about? And when you see and contrast Kennedy and Johnson, kiss your life goodbye because it beco it becomes so fascinating you might end up with shelves and shelves and shelves of books and years and years and years of studying being fascinated about these people because of what it sheds light on the human condition and i know before, before we're done we're going to put all this in the context of the horrible things facing america right now and the inspiration what would kennedy do is so it's at our fingertips, especially for young men. This is my soapbox. I'll save it for later, but it's really about there. There is no time to waste on video games. There is no time to waste scrolling through your phone. If you want to be America or if you want anything like freedom, if you want to avoid unnatural sicknesses and deaths yourself, let alone if you've got kids and care about the future, you've got to contemplate what it means to be an American. And there's no better example than the life and uh, work of John F. Kennedy. No question about that. Um, you know, he was, and you said it, Bruce, he knew what he was up against and he did it anyway. He knew any day that, that it could all be over. And I think the fact that, you know, he had to take Johnson as his running mate to get the South, you know, what, uh, I mean, he, he had to, I guess, hold his nose, right? Because, Wait, he but, but he was, he was blackmailed by Johnson and Hoover to put Johnson on the ticket. Evelyn Lincoln said in a documentary evidence of revision evan lincoln was his longtime secretary through his senate years and through the white house and she said the morning after kennedy got the democrat nomination in july in los angeles hoover or maybe that night but by the next morning she saw john kennedy tell bobby kennedy in the hotel room that i have to take johnson because if not he and hoover will expose what hoover has on john's John Kennedy's womanizing. That's why Johnson was vice president. Wow. But even still, Bruce, I, I, who knows if he would have, if he would have won, you know, the way he did, um, if he would have won the South, if he didn't have uh, Johnson, he was going to go with someone else, maybe Symington. Yeah. And I forget the other, the other fellow. So it worked out for the, for the election. Right. But, 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 when, you know, but yeah, and when Johnson took the vice presidency, people close to him and said, why would you trade in the powerful Senate majority sh leadership for the piss and do nothing vice presidency? And he said, because I'm a gambling man and five out of 35 presidents died in office, son. And back to the civil rights. Wow. There are folks who have really studied Johnson who've said he he held back on every chance as the Senate leader to do anything for civil rights, scheming to be president one day and then unload it, knowing it would be a historical landmark thing to emulate, imitate FDR and the giant size and impact of legislation he helped pass. So that's another factor in that the civil rights under Johnson. Yeah, that's true. He voted against every civil rights legislation for, for years. Johnson. So, to you know, when they make him out to be this big civil rights hero, it's almost laughable, yep. you know, and, and like I said before, Bobby deserves a lot of credit. That's the only reason Bobby stayed on to, to make sure that 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 bill got passed. But but one of the, the worst, you know, the worst changes, we talked a lot about the changes that Johnson did, but the, the worst was the full reversal of Vietnam, because, you know, there's no doubt, Bruce, and, and you know, this that that Kennedy was pulling the advisors out. He was getting out of Vietnam. He was never going to escalate that war. And, and that war had such an impact, a negative impact on, on, the, on this country, of course, that country. And, and it, it's, it lasted for, for generations. It just destroyed the fabric. It almost ripped the country apart. 
And yeah. and when people say that, you know, Kennedy got us into Vietnam, I mean, it's just that that, that statement there, and they're teaching that in schools. That, that's what's disgusting is, and, and we had Professor uh, Paul Blow on from Canada, and he talked about the study he did, and he said that, you know, teachers that that say that they're they're violating their code of conduct hmm. when they when they say stuff like that because they're they're not going with the information that's out now, the declassified documents that show that that Kennedy was pulling out, you know, and Sam two sixty three was pulling out thousand advisors a month, and in the end result of all personnel out of Vietnam and Johnson reversed that. Well, well, Kennedy's not even in the ground yet. You know, he's in the casket yeah. and, and that Monday after the assassination and Johnson reverses that. And then of all the things Johnson reversed, that was the worst, I think, because it, it tore this country apart. No question about it. Yeah. And Vietnam, uh, the conflict there was created by America. We imposed a, a, a government in the south part of the country in 1954 and installed this guy. No, ZM. Yeah. Yes. And it was and... General Ed Lansdale that did that. Yeah. It was Alan Dulles' guy. Yeah. And in the late 50s, Lansdale, I believe, was in charge of the effort to bring from North Vietnam one or two million of those natives who've been there for who were there for ten thousand tens of thousands of years, okay? Just farmers in the marsh fields, okay? Right. And brought them down to the south to South Vietnam, where they were strangers unwelcome unwanted scrounging scrounging and stealing to survive maybe they spoke a different dialect maybe they spoke a different language and they were demonized as the Viet Cong they were demonized as the invading north vietnamese to justify uh, a big war there that kennedy stood in the way of for for his entire presidency in late in late 61 he conceded a little and he started ballooning the number of military advisors over there. It was almost as if after a year of big jockeying and battles and, and, and real scary problems with Khrushchev and the Soviet Union, things just about settled down in late 61. And in December is when Kennedy approved, already started sending over more advisors. And within two years, there were about 16,000 there. Mm -hmm. But he was questioning it every single month. And like you just well described, the record is perfectly clear right now. By the end of six, by the end of his life at late 63, with his peace initiative, with the signing of the limited test ban treaty, with all the positive response and reply from the Soviet Union, Kennedy stood at the United Nations in September and proposed a joint mission to the moon with the Soviet Union. And maybe this pause in the Cold War, we can extend it. And we've got a real chance to make this the best generation of humanity that has has ever lived. And in that context, in October, he signed that order to 263 to pull the first thousand out by the end of the year and get the rest of them out by the end of 65. Absolutely. There was not going to be the nightmare of Vietnam in the 1960s. And Bruce, one of the things I think a lot of people don't understand about that, about that end, Sam, is that, you know, and I said this before, I was in logistics management for for 20 years. And, you know, it, logistics is the same, whether you're talking about, you know, military, bringing military equipment and, and personnel. I mean, when he says that he's getting a thousand uh, advisors out by December of, of 63, by November 22nd, the day that Kennedy was assassinated, that is fully in motion. I know that from somebody who's involved in, in logistics for all these years. You can't do that. There's so much in the background, especially when you're dealing with with military personnel and in and, and equipment and stuff. So that was fully in motion when Kennedy was assassinated. And when Johnson reverses that, it's a, it's a full reversal. And then he actually puts in the the Americanization of the war because you know Kennedy was was de-Americanizing the war and he was getting out completely. And and the interesting thing he said to McNamara later is he said we're getting out whether we win it or lose it, and we're going to deal with the government that that's in place. So even in a losing scenario, Kennedy was getting out. He understood, you know, we don't belong there. I think he yeah. even questioned, you know, who are we liberating over there? Right. Because all they're trying to do is end colonialism, going yeah. back to when the French were there. And and we know Kennedy's history of, of anti-colonialism goes back to his Irish roots. We talked about this before. Yeah. You know, he was very anti-colonialism. He he's seen what it's done in Africa. He saw what it's done in Northern Ireland. 
And, and, you know, I think that was very important. And Vietnam was about colonialism. That's what it was about. Right. And every school boy or girl who learns what America is or is supposed to be would do what President Kennedy did, because that's activating uh, walking our talk. Our talk is supposed to be all people are created equal and only those laws are just that are derived from the consent of the government. And isn't that the kind of democracies that every president says they're trying to foster in other countries? But those are just cover lies. But Kennedy was the real deal actually trying to do it. Working, doing marketing for Trine Day and being kind of mentored by Chris Milligan, the publisher over there, and helping with a hundred and some episodes of his podcast, Eve's participating in all those interviews. There's a scenario of Kennedy's assassination being a ritualistic killing of the king that was uh, implemented by, from the secret societal level well represented by Skull and Bones. They're not the only secret society that meddles in, in governmental and public affairs because they saw it worked so well after the American Civil War with the assassination of Lincoln and a generation of young Americans decimated by death and injuries and sickness and illness and drug addiction due to their injuries in the Civil War, they simply recreated it in the 1960s, literally, in order to have the war in Vietnam be a conveyor belt of bringing young guys over for just a year or two. I think a lot of their terms were a year. In other every other war, you don't go home until the war is won. But in Vietnam, your, your tour of duty was for just one year and you go home. Why? The goal was to develop this conveyor belt of transportation of drugs coming through this new area of the world, because it had been going through Turkey, the French connection. But by the late 50s, they saw we want to kind of move the route of where drugs come into the United States. And it's a horrible reality that our military helped bring, smuggle heroin here to the United States, not only in the body bags of many of our dead servicemen, but stuffed in their cadavers as well. That's the enormity of the evil that has taken over our government and the the horrible empire we support with our tax dollars. Yeah, I mean, some of the things the CIA was involved in is just it just it gets worse and worse when you when you dig into it, Bruce. But let's move on to the next thing, because I want to talk about 9-11, because this is something that, you know, me and Bill have we haven't talked about this on our show at all yet. We actually saved it for you, buddy. And and it's something that, you know, I haven't, I'm going to be honest with you, Bruce, I haven't looked into it a lot. Um, I am, you know, familiar with a lot of the, the uh, you know, discrepancies in the official story and stuff, but I haven't investigated to the extent I investigated the, the Kennedy assassination or the other assassination in the 60s. And that's by design because I, I'm just, I, I'm just so disgusted with, with what happened there. And and to think that if there was any collusion at all to for to to start two wars and to create a surveillance state and this to create a war on terrorism that 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 is just the level of disgusting that that is is just is something I didn't want to go down that road to be honest with you. So let's let's get into it. Let's get into nine eleven. Let's get into the problems with the official story. And the first thing I want to ask you, Bruce, because I'm I'm really familiar with this, is the day before nine eleven. Donald Rumsfeld comes out and he says there's 32 trillion dollars missing from the Pentagon. And then the next day 9/11 happens and all of a sudden you don't hear about the 32 trillion missing, but there was all kind of rumors that the auditors investigating and looking into that were in that part of the building that the, the planes hit on the Pentagon and stuff. What do we know about that now about the 32 trillion missing? Uh could you give us some details on that? Yes. My memory is the figure he announced was $2.3 trillion. Okay, I thought it was 32. It might as well be, because it's so astronomical, and it is such a crime against the trust of the United States of America that there is an agency out there that can just confess, we, oops, we lost $2.3 trillion. We can't account for it. Holy smokes. We are a banana republic. Case closed. Let's go to the bar. That's all you have to know. If you lost $2.3 trillion, no one's fired. No one's punished. There's no investigation into it. 
that okay that that's that's like four or five episodes to just talk about whatever that implies right there but yes the area of the pentagon that was destroyed i believe was the office among the office of naval intelligence they were investigating um financial shenanigans related to government securities this is deep research it's in my book related to some number of billion dollars that were issued in government securities 10 years prior i think in 1993 it was a fund it was backed by gold that we had secretly confiscated from the nazis and from japan okay and we issued these securities secretly in order to fund what we did for the next 10 years to the old soviet union the games we played with their economy, the oligarchs that we propped up and put into position in order to control the uh, the oil and the gas resources of the Soviet Union. This was a very, very nefarious thing. And the evidence indicates that the two giant brokerage firms that handled these kinds of securities for the United States were Cantor Fitzgerald and the other one that was in the towers. Plus, that office at the Pentagon was also involved in starting to investigate this and also the research has come out that september 12th was the eight or nine or ten year deadline when these would have to be quote unquote cleared through wall street so part of the destruction of that day was to obliterate accurate knowledge of that transaction by the afternoon of september 11th i think the federal reserve had declared an emergency so it allowed them to clear and process all the complicated imagine the complicated financial transactions that were messed up because those two giant brokerage firms in the towers were taken out and i believe they took the direct hits of each of the each of the towers so that's that's what i know about the money the most important thing about the money involved behind it 911 was the excuse for for a lot more things sean yes it's your worst nightmare, the involvement, the staging of 9-11 by uh, either elements of our government or elements that our government contracted, because we like to use cutouts, you know, to do to inflict things on ourselves. Government, the government will often contract some allies intelligence service, just like overseas, a country that wants to do the same kind of shenanigans to themselves or their own people. They'll use our things. So. This is what happened on 9-11. The day before, FEMA and other emergency uh, teams were all around New York City, supposedly for drills. On the day of 9-11, there were over 40 military drills taking place, a number of which took the fighter jets that protect the East Coast, all but a couple of them, and sent them way out west and sent them way up north, maybe toward near Alaska. So now we're totally exposed. Also, those military war games embedded false decoy blips on the radar screens of air traffic controllers all around the country. So when the attacks happened, there's audio recordings of air traffic controllers getting the word, there's hijacked planes, is this real world or exercise? It was chaos. That's part of the subterfuge of the cover of, uh, of the events. And my book has all this listed in one succinct chapter, but here's an author or two, David Ray Griffin. By 2004, he had, I think, one of the first groundbreaking books out called The New Pearl Harbor, Disturbing Questions About the Bush Administration and 9-11. And there were a bunch of documentaries also at that time. But some foundational pieces of evidence or facts that I'd put on the table to get everybody scratching their head and realizing, yeah, this is the official story is just nonsense. The major, 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 major one is not the towers. It's not the Pentagon. It's not what happened to the plane in Pennsylvania, and we'll talk about that in a minute. It's World Trade Center Building 7, which was a 47-story building in the World Trade Center complex. In many cities and towns in the United States, it would have been the tallest building in their city, which suffered some debris damage when the towers came down in the morning, had some fires, and at 5 o'clock in the afternoon... A lady on the BBC reported that 
the Solomon Brothers Building World Trade Center 7 has just collapsed. But over her shoulder, you see it still standing there. 20 minutes later, there's video of firemen on the street telling people that building's about to come down, back up, back up. And at 520, whoosh, it came down in free fall, at free fall speed in a controlled demolition. Worse, two or three years later, when the 9-11 Commission report comes out, boy, I think I'm remembering this dead on. The official report of 9-11 doesn't mention Building 7. Now, at no other time in history have skyscrapers collapsed from burning. Not when they've burned five hours, 19 hours. In 2005, a building in Philadelphia burned for 24 hours. And some of its top floors buckled and crimped just a little. And after days of burning, you have a charred skeleton. But we're supposed to believe after 56 minutes, the South Tower collapsed because of fire. And then an hour and 42 minutes, the North Tower. When you watch those towers come down, turn the sound off and watch the clip over and over. And you tell me whether or not what you're seeing are successive explosions in sequence, creating the illusion of descent. But it's a series of explosion. Control demolition means inside jobs. And the, the icing on the cake is experienced pilots and, simula pilots and simulators have never been able to do what the Muslim hijacker supposedly did with Flight 77 into the Pentagon. An accelerating corkscrew 330 degree turn bullseye hitting his target without touching the grass every experienced pilot who's tried it in a pilot in a simulator has crashed the plane has never reached the wall but a guy who couldn't fly a one engine cessna we're supposed to believe look at the contempt look how stupid they think we are and this incriminates every word out of the mainstream media and anybody who professes the official story there's a lot there bruce i mean first one of the things that really got my radar up when when this whole thing happened was when they they had the truth commission and originally they were gonna put henry kissinger as the head of that commission which is laughable because it's alan dulles all over again with the warren commission i mean if you want a truth commission and Alan Dulles is dead. The next guy who's the, the gatekeeper to all the secrets would be Henry Kissinger. Yep. I mean, to make him, uh, that that was just, you know, that got my radar up. But um, that Tower 7 really is troubling. I mean, it's and, and there's a group of architects, right, that that got together and... In, in, oh, yeah. Like there's, there's many of groups that... of... Me there's many groups of many professionals, pilots, firefighters who all dispute, but... Richard Gage originally founded or was uh, architects and engineers for 9/11 Truth. He has since right. left that group, but their site is ae911truth.org, and anyone with anyone in 20 minutes would see such overwhelming evidence that at least their minds would open. You know, hopefully people look at evidence until they get convinced beyond a reasonable doubt before they open their mouth and say something as stupid as, "I believe this happened." My God, we've all got to pull back from that. You guys are great at that. Sure. You guys are great at hedging and saying, wait a second, I, I have not seen enough documentation for any claim before I get to the point where I say, oh, I'm certain or I believe so and so. But the, the evidence is voluminous about 9-11. So I guess my, my question, Bruce, because, you know, you, you mentioned that um, no skyscraper has ever fallen <clears throat> uh, from, you know, from a fire before. But, I mean, if you look at what happened, Essentially, a bomb went off, an entire huge bomb went off in each one of those buildings. So it's a little bit different than than just, you know, a fire. I mean, that was an explosion, you know, that, that cut right through the middle of the building and just sat there. Well, it's 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 dozens, if not hundreds of sequential explosions that blasted pieces hundreds of yards laterally. Right. And better than that, Bill, is the fact that. The floor is pancaked and stacked. The floor is pancaked and stacked. And people look at the debris, which is ground level. 
there are no stacks of floors. And they say the floors pancaked and stacked. There were holes in the ground in a couple areas down to the basement levels. Sure. There were survivors who lucked up through the smoke at blue sky. The, the buildings were demolished while they stood in midair. They didn't pancake and stack. Wow. That's, that's, this is literally the equivalent of, look at the emperor's new clothes. Yeah. Aren't they beautiful? And he's standing so, there buck-ass naked. I mean, it makes sense. You would think there would be a huge pile. 110 of- stories each. Yeah. The stack of floors would be 30 stories high, yeah. 40 wow. stories high. Yeah. Firemen on the scene, demolition, you know, cleaner uppers said, we didn't find a toilet. We didn't find a desk. We didn't find a file cabinet. The biggest intact piece of anything I found was the keypad off of a phone. The explosive power is is practically unchartable. Mm -hmm. And then there's Judy Wood's book, Where Did the Tower Goes? And she makes the case for directed energy because there are incredible stories of burnt cars all the way at the East River, a line of cars burnt. Where yeah. they sat, where hey, ha, who, ha, who, ha, who, ha, what, what, how? I don't begin to you know go into that because you, you don't have to because that's she's well disputed and whatever. But the rest of it, Richard Gage and Stephen Jones, uh, another analyst of the explosive material, amazing, amazing. Yeah, and then um, uh, what you were saying about the the plane that that hit the Pentagon. I know that there have been. People who have said that you know they didn't find enough of the of the plane to suggest that th- that it even hit right is that what uh, yeah that's what I believe I believe that so what happened to the plane then okay th- what I believe this is what I believe this is what I saw I saw a documentary called Pentacon maybe it's hard to find boy YouTube used to be great and they interviewed a couple of cops who were at a gas station right on the other side of a little high of a highway facing that Pentagon wall and they said we saw a plane head toward the Pentagon, and then we saw a big explosion, okay? And when you pay attention to where they stood and where they pointed and this, that, and the other thing, the plane went toward the Pentagon from this direction, but the hole in the wall and in the next three hallways, the rings of the Pentagon were in this direction. So is the little film clip, and so are the knockdown light poles. So what I think maybe seriously happened is, as... A plane as a plane went over the Pentagon, maybe a dummy decoy representing the hijacked plane will get into whether or not it really was Flight 77 or not simultaneously with the missile strike. So it could confuse everybody and look forever because within minutes, teams, government teams captured all the video cameras and surveillance cameras that they could find from all the businesses and gas stations surrounding the area, which were a lot less than the cameras that are all over the place. Now, that's what I thought. Oh, because there's also a survivor, April Gallo, I think her name is, worked in the Pentagon. And she said she got to work. She had her kid with her in the office near where the the blast was. And she turned on her computer. And when she pushed the button of her computer, an explosion just, just blew her off her feet and destroyed the room. And everything was frozen at 931. And she found her baby under de- debris. And as she's trying to struggle her way out, she heard another big bang. Maybe she heard another two big, big explosions. And she found the hole and she went out through the hole. And she said, there was nothing that looked like a plane there. No plane parts, no luggage, no seats, no bodies, no nothing. And she actually sued the Pentagon and Dick Cheney. How come you didn't protect us when the records prove that all the flight controllers in the country knew at 918 that flight 77 had turned around and was heading west and the towers had already been hit how come the pentagon wasn't wasn't protected yeah the the cherry on that little story is the testimony of secretary of transportation uh, secretary of transportation norman Mineta told the 911 commission around 930 he was in the bunker under the white house and maybe it was 925 and a man came in the room and told Vice President Cheney, there's a there's a plane heading to Washington. 
do the orders still stand? And Cheney said, of course the orders still stand. Have you heard anything to the contrary? And then a number of minutes later, the Pentagon got hit. So you put all that together, and, and then the official story says, oh, no, no, Cheney wasn't even in the bunker then. And the, uh, the plane hit the Pentagon at 9.37 or 9.38 when April's computer and her watch show that it, the Pentagon blew up at 9.31. Bruce, I want to go back to Tower 7 for a second. Uh, is it true that, that uh, Dick Cheney and Rumsfeld were on the advisory board of the Solomon Smith and Barney that were in, that were in that Tower 7? Because I read that in several areas. I think they were on the project for the New American Century that produced Rebuilding America's defensive, Defenses a year before 9-11, calling for, not calling for, but you know what they said, you know, we can't get the American people behind our military goals for the 21st century, absent a new Pearl Harbor. And that was a year before 9-11, but I don't know if they were on that board. I know that Bush Sr. went on to work for the Carlisle Group and was at a Carlisle Group, a big investment firm, billions of dollars under management. And he was at a breakfast that morning with one of Osama bin Laden's brothers, who also had investments in the Carlisle Group. So apparently Bush Sr. and bin Laden's brother made money after the attacks of 9-11 because ginning up for the war on terror, their holdings in military companies uh, went up. Was it and true that the the CIA had a had an office in Tower Seven? I think I recall confirm? something like that. I re, I recall that Tower Seven had Rudy Giuliani, the mayor, his command center, and had other government things there. Maybe the SEC, the Security Exchange Commission. So those that's all very very uh, likely, but I can't say definitively. So you're you're familiar with Operation Northwoods, uh, yes. Operation Northwoods, you know, Bill, we talked about this before. This was, you know, the 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 Joint Chiefs basically went to Kennedy with this this outrageous plan where they would simulate attacks uh, in the United States and make it look like it was Castro and and in order to start a war. Um, which, when you read it, you know, and of course Kennedy, you know, he he got rid of it, and he, you know, after that he he forced Lemonser out of jo as Joint Chiefs. Um, you know, he he was appalled that, that they would even, uh, uh, you know, suggest this to him. But, um, you know, when you read Operation Northwoods, I mean, it's eerily similar to what happened on 9-11. Do you think, Bruce, yeah. that it, there's a possibility that this was Operation Northwoods that reactivated or activated 40 years after it was originally proposed to Kennedy? Yeah, it sure seems like, uh, you know, a, a clone of it. And the other day, yesterday, I just interviewed Captain Dan Hanley, a retired United Airlines pilot, who is the director of a new group called 911 Whistleblowers, 911pilots.org. Uh, and they're contending, they have the evidence, that something called the, the irreversible autopilot, I'll look it up was probably used on the plane that day. This is a system that can be embedded unbeknownst to the airline, unbeknownst to the airline, into planes that lets a remote controller capture and take a plane wherever it wants. And he proves that that technology was available at least by the 1980s. And, the, and Northwoods implies that it, was in, it existed in 1962. And the plan was to really kill people. The proposal of Northwoods was, ugh, how did they phrase it? Maybe it was... With or without real casualties, we could target Americans, Cubans on the streets of these cities. Um, we could we could fly a passenger plane, replace it in midair with uh, an, an auto controlled plane that we then blow up and say that Cuba Fidel blew it up, and that's our pretext to go invade and conquer right. Cuba uh, in March, I think sixty two. Mm -hmm. Bruce, talk to me about uh, the the anthrax attack that was used uh, immediately after nine eleven. Um, is is it true that you know that that originally was traced back to a to a U.S. facility in Maryland? Is is that confirmed? Do you know if that can, that's confirmed? Because I've heard reports on that. I I've seen that confirmed that it was traced back to a military lab. I think Fort Detrick. I think Maryland. If those are wrong, the rest of it is true, and they scapegoated. A sucker, one of the one of a government employee named Bruce Ivins, and harassed him, and he denied it, and they pinned it on him, and then he was found dead 
And I think they called it a suicide. Who knows if it was really a suicide? The harassment may have reached the suicidal level, but yeah. And who was the anthrax sent to? It was sent to a couple of senators who were saying, I don't want to sign the USA Patriot Act until I read it, please. Is that too unreasonable? And then after the anthrax stuff, wow, you know, 17 people were hurt. Five people were killed in the handling and the delivery of those uh, anthrax laced letters to those. And also a couple of journalists, I think Tom Brokaw. And yeah, they, they, that, that has been definitively proved to my memory that the, that that anthrax was anthrax was was among if not the most highly developed version of the disease with all the markers conclusively united states military now remember they don't care if we connect these dots they don't care if we connect right. the dots of oswald couldn't have alone done what happened on elm street they they want us to know that they can do whatever they want they can lie in our faces about it and they will kill and stonewall as long as it takes. Because there's no accountability. There's no accountability. And the mainstream media is going to report the, their official version of the story. Right. Whatever right. they're they're told to say is what they're going to say. And, and for people know that. that, you know, for people that think that, well, how, you know, uh, the government wouldn't do that. The government wouldn't kill its own people sean what was what was uh bombs away lemay what was his line that uh, well he said you know collateral damage 20 million dead americans collateral damage to get rid of communism and and now that yeah, bruce you know we we just did a series that's coming out this week on, on charles manson and tom o'neill's great book on on operation chaos and um cointel pro and mk ultra and all the other mind control programs i mean these were these were covert operations against u.s citizens that's what mm -hmm. people don't understand. Like, like when they say, when I hear people say, well, the government wouldn't do this against their own people. Are you kidding me? Like, this is a history of doing this. Like Operation Chaos, and I've read a lot of the files on that. It's one of the worst covert operations against its own citizens that I've, I've ever read. I mean, it's disgusting when you read it. And the same thing with COINTELPRO mm -hmm. and MK Ultra. I mean, what, are, mm -hmm. what do you think the people, I mean, this was an experiment on U.S. citizens right. by the government. And and it accomplished what what they set out to accomplish. They wanted an excuse to go into Iraq. They wanted an excuse to go into Af Afghanistan. And the, you know what they did was they riled up the American public. They got everybody in a frenzy. I, I was one of them. I was someone who said, "Yeah, we we have to do this. We have to you know get payback." And then you know years later, Sean, how many times did we have the discussion? What was the point? Why would they why would we invade these countries? It would be like in in order to take down the mafia, we in, we invaded Italy. Yeah, like you understand now that, you know, Iraq was, you know, weapons of mass destruction. That that was a that joke. Was all there was, nobody, no, nobody believed that. I people no, I mean, then, and certainly not now. I I, th I think that we we needed a war to justify the continuation of our we unnecessary uh, military industrial complex. Well, if we don't have an enemy, we invent one, right, Sean? That was the... Yeah, what, that's, what was that? uh, I think, another great quote by Alan Dulles. Wow, yeah, we've got many we, of them like that. We've been creating them for half a century. Yeah. You know, we we propped up originally Saddam Hussein. We helped right. uh, Muammar Gaddafi. We propped up Manuel Noriega in uh, Panama. And then... When their usefulness is done, we need a handy war, or they just won't do everything we demand. We demonize them, take them out, and put child pornography and drugs in their residencies and say, look, these guys were fiends and they deserved them. And, of course, you know, the, during when Russia invaded Afghanistan, you know, we supported bin Laden and the Mojahideen. And, yeah. um, you know, and, and the thing about, you know, if, if, if Afghanistan was all about getting bin Laden, I mean, why did we stay there, what, eight, nine years after he was, right. oh, you know, he was killed? After September 11th, and we were saying it's bin Laden, he's in Afghanistan. Afghanistan said, show us proof it's bin Laden, and we'll turn him over to you. And we said no. And then we started bombing about a month later. And then Afghanistan said, all right, we're just going to give him to you. Just stop bombing and go away. And we said no. And now that country is completely destabilized into savage conditions, just like Iraq is destabilized into savage conditions, just like Libya is destabilized into savage conditions, just like all our borders are open 
destabilizing us into more and more savage conditions, just like Europe has been destabilized by refugees of our war on terror since the mid-2000s because of, uh, you know, what we've done. And I really think it's psychopaths at the top, these oligarchs, these rich of the rich, who are above the corporations and above the political parties. They just have nothing better to do than just to try to figure out how can I own and control more and more and more until I own and control everything? Maybe they even do this subconsciously. And how can I sicken and weaken any and all uh, opposition? And whether that means eliminating you know, 10% of the world's population, 20%, maybe they don't have a number, they don't have a goal. They're just obviously doing what they're doing. And our opportunity is as Americans to hold our ideals high and try to motivate everyone who's listening to start a podcast, write a book, start a Substack series, and start finding and talking about the truth. It's our only hope. Yeah. You just can't imagine how evil, you know, I mean, how how could you even be that how could somebody be that evil but it, it exists and it's our plight it's the story of humanity going back as far as history shows us and that and that's a relief these times are not special it's it's just same as it always was and in fact as far as written history goes there have always been cults and factions that have said repent the end of the world is near you know and they 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 go to a mountaintop they drink the kool-aid they want to be rescued by the passing comet and they'll kill themselves let's not yeah. lose our heads right because uh people make money by scaring us into clicking and following and buying their newspapers and we have to stay calm and we also have to believe in life finds a way to quote jurassic park and better philosophers yeah. Hey, Bruce, earlier, uh, Sean, I don't know if you have, had anything else, but I, I want to ask Bruce one. one I know, uh, but go ahead. So earlier on, um, when you were talking about your book, you said you said something. Um, I think you said there's only one of us here. Is it, yes. is it what you said? What do you mean by that? It's a, That's summarizing uh, the thoughts of existentialism and it's all even modern quantum physics and what energy is and contemplating consciousness and the philosophies and the ruminations of writers going back centuries that this is something of an illusion the easterns or the mayan or the the indians call this maya it's an illusion that the only thing that exists bill is an eternal consciousness spirit essence that I like to think is entertaining itself by appearing to itself as one among others. Meaning, what someone's, what I'm saying to you right now is coming from the same place as the thoughts that come to you when you're alone in a room. Mm -hmm. It's all coming from the same place. And so this is the, this is the magic and the, this is the magic and the mystery of conversation and dialogue. Because you could buy a blank notebook and start a conversation between two characters and maybe never run out of what they will say. Right. Where are all these thoughts coming from? Now we need we need Maharishis and gurus here right now to help me out. Yeah. So it's like the collective consciousness is what you're saying, right? That's well, that's a specific concept based on Jung. So people who know Jung are going to refer to that. But mm -hmm. what I think you're trying to rephrase is there's one mind. Right. Which is what the first generation and subsequent gener generations of quantum physicists say based on laboratory experiments over years where the intention of the observer, nothing he says or does, influences the outcome of an experiment down at that quantum level which is the which is an undefinable word for what energy is which is what everything is made out of hmm. in a sense this is a phrase they love there is no place where you stop and i start there is no place where you stop and the rest of the universe is meaning there's nothing to fear because there's nothing but us Right. 
Right. And you lay it. Now, here's the hope. What the thousands and thousands and thousands of people have reported who had near-death experiences, they were clinically dead. Two minutes, five minutes, seven minutes, 20 minutes. D-E-D, dead. And then they come back. And the similarity of the things that they describe, the similarity of what they describe is my greatest hope. Because this is not who and what we really are. That's the best that they can explain it. Yeah, wow. I guess, yeah, I guess I kind of hope that that's, that's the case. <laughs> Bruce, let um, me go back to... Banking to, on it, yeah. ...to something, because um, to, to me, that Tower 7 is just, it, it's fascinating. I think that's the... That's like the to me. That's like the Mexico City, uh, the Kennedy assassination. Like it's the <laughs> the Holy Grail of everything. And yeah. and on this show, we talk. You know, two of our main villains. It seems in every single podcast episode we do is is Alan Dulles and David Rockefeller. Uh, we know Rockefeller had a lot to do with the the creation of the Twin Towers originally. Um, but there's also rumors that he was involved in, in Solomon and Barney, and and uh, that's David Rockefeller specifically. Is is there any truth to that? Well, the, the maybe it's the Solomon Brothers. I don't know if you've got the name of the firm right. And I don't know the, the name of any particular firm like that that he was involved with, except to know that he was involved with decades and decades of different financial institutions and had his fingers at the highest level of plotting and planning as a very, very active Rockefeller, continuing right. the family's history of orchestrating events here in America in collusion with elements in Great Britain, going back to the family's partnership with the Rothschilds in the 1800s. Right. Well, and this is it. Go ahead, Bruce. Well, and also just the the social engineering and mind control that America suffers under from our major uh, universities, academic institutions, and think tanks and philanthropies uh, are implementing psychological warfare against us for over 150 years and to develop a number of horrible things that harm and control us for instance the pharmaceutical industry i was just going to say that yeah, yeah the rockefellers are all are yeah. all in that and his memoirs came out in the early 90s and supposedly he stood at a un or a council on foreign relations meeting and said my family's been accused of pursuing an agenda that undermines the sovereignty of the United States in pursuit of something called a one world order. Well, if that's the accusation, I confess it with pride or something like that. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Well, well Bruce, I know we took up a lot of your time. Uh, I just have a couple more things. Do we have, we have time for a couple more, Billy? Sure. Yeah. If Bruce, if Bruce can stay, well, let's, Bruce, I'm just right, getting, buddy? I'm just getting warmed up. I, I'd all like right. to keep him on for yeah, I mean this. Night, this is fascinating, buddy. This, this is, is a fascinating discussion. It really is, yeah. sir. But uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people that that are listening, uh, a lot of our audience, uh, I, I I'm sure they're a little bit skeptical on the on the stuff we said about 9/11. Um, hmm. what what else could you say to them about the official story that that is just such a discrepancy that you're saying it's like, you know, it's like the Oswald lone nut uh, garbage. Like, what could you say that we haven't discussed yet about the official story? All right, I'll just I'll say what comes to mind, and I, I know I'll get to more I haven't said. Buildings don't collapse that fast. Inexperienced pilots can't fly planes like that. And that's, and that's what the professionals say. Now, of course, the mainstream media, since the day of 9-11, has trotted out their experts to verify the official story. I don't care. One has to one has to look at what other experts have to say and the other uh, evidence. I mean, there are physicists, et cetera, who have given hour long public presentations, PowerPoint presentations. Richard Gage, 911.org, I think is where independent Richard Gage broke off. But to back to your particular question. No plane hit Building 7, 47 stories tall, had had some smoldering fires on some low floors, like maybe the 15th floor or the 20th floor. And you can see the films. It comes down in free fall speed. And if you remember anything from eighth grade physics, 
For anything to fall at free form fall speed means there's nothing resisting the path of its fall. So all the columns failed simultaneously. That does not happen because of fire. Here's another tidbit. There's a recording of a police captain. I think his name is Oreo, believe it or not, Palmer, something like that. And he got up in one of the towers. And you can hear the recording of him talking down to his team. There's just two small pockets of fire. We can knock it out with two lines, which are two hoses. That's all he found. So the fire wasn't hot enough to destabilize. First of all, building fires don't get hot enough to destabilize and weaken and cripple the steel. Like I said before, in those examples of buildings that burned for 5, 19, and 24 hours. Here's another one. There's a film of the burning hole in the North Tower. And then, boom, you see a woman get blown out at explosive force. Was that a bomb that went off? spontaneously early there's another there's another film of one of those holes i guess it's in the south tower of a woman waving something like a shirt or a white towel standing in the burning hole of the fire that's supposedly so hot it destabilized and weakened a building so um that's the best I got from the hip about what makes the official story. Oh, ah, Pennsylvania, United Flight 10. Right. Yeah. Okay. Witnesses heard and saw a missile streak. They heard a jet streak. They saw an explosion in the sky. There was a debris field six miles away. Burning debris fell on people, I think, five miles away. A plane engine was found one mile away. And when you look at the picture, oh, and the people who got to the scene of where the plane supposedly were told crashed in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, there's no plane parts. There's a there's a smoldering gash on top of an old gash in the ground. And the trees nearby are all incinerated from some kind of fire over over in the trees. And it's all roped off. And, you know, the first news reports are the best because the local people got close enough to say, we don't see bodies, we don't see chairs, we don't see luggage, we don't see wings, we don't see anything. And they tell us with this, the official story tells us with a straight face, the plane burrowed deep into the ground. Hmm. Well, we know what uh, Jesse Ventura has said about the official story. It's there to protect the officials. Uh, that's it. Yep. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think that there's, it wouldn't surprise me, you know, if that, if that plane was, was shot down, um, it wouldn't surprise me in the least, you know, and we've been lied to, I mean, what, uh, you know, we've been lied to about so many things over the years and, and for people to still have that naive belief that our government wouldn't lie to us about something like that. Come on. But here's what I would tell to, to a skeptic. I would say this, imagine you're a judge. And I'm coming to you and telling you we need to investigate what really happened on 9-11 because of these anomalies, okay? And I put on the table all that, and you're evaluating like, wow, do we reopen the case? Based on everything I just said, right, you know, in the we've all discussed in this whole episode, if you were a judge, ladies and gentlemen, who might be a skeptic of what I'm saying, would you at least have an open mind to say, my God, first of all, I have to see if what Bruce and Sean and Bill have just discussed is true then if it is would you authorize an official official investigation where witnesses are called in and all that evidence is is brought in front of you or sent to your computer so you can look at it? there's a lot more evidence and testimony that united 10 was was shot down there's an air force pilot who uh he was up in the air that day and when he landed to base he was told by by people you know other people in the air force that we shot down united 10 over pennsylvania yeah and here's a couple other things about the the, the air response we were originally told no jet fighters got into the air on 9 11 what why we don't know a failure of chain of command and then over the next week and 10 days the story changed oh uh, well the military was told yeah but there was no response Oh, the military was told, but then there was a very, very delayed response. Then the then the then the jets went out, but they went out at they were told to fly at third speed. 
oh, okay. And one team wasn't sent to any area of concern. They were sent out toward Europe over the Atlantic Ocean to create that 90-minute window where all the planes could boom, 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 get where mm -hmm. they're going. When normally any plane, in the any commercial plane, varies off course or doesn't verbally respond to, hey, uh, you're a little off course. What's going on up there, Bill? If they don't respond, fighter jets are next to them within 20 minutes wow. to investigate and compel them to go where they yeah. need to go. And like I said yeah. at the top, military exercises all over the place had most of our fighter jets off to the west and off up in the north near <laughs> Alaska, I believe. So now you're the judge. Oh, also, the president of the United States for 14 months says, I don't want to investigate 9-11. Why? I don't want to tell you. I don't want we're not going to investigate 9-11. We need to focus on finding bin Laden. We're right. not going to we're not the president of the United States stonewalled an investigation into the attacks of 9-11. Anything fishy there? Smell a little funny? Well, I can tell you, Bruce, you know, the first thing I'm thinking, if I'm an investigator, I would ask the first question I would ask is, is you're telling me, you know, Al-Qaeda is the only suspect and that's this is it. How would they possibly have the intelligence to know or to have the, the information to know that the military would be on all these training exercises on, on the exact day that the attack was? That would be question number one. How would they get that intelligence? Every person and system in place to defend against hijacked planes, every single one, quote unquote, failed on 9-11. Hijackers with weapons were allowed to get on board. The official story says none of the pilots, the real pilots of the planes, followed protocol. None of them punched in the four-digit code saying we're high being hijacked. None of them. Mm -hmm. Some of these guys were big ex-military pilots. Okay? And then... The, the likelihood of the planes being remote controlled and replaced by remote controlled anyway. The people in New York who saw, who said it wasn't a commercial plane. It didn't have the markings and windows. It was a solid gray or black. And that's the film of the plane going into the South Tower. Those are the pictures of its underbelly that it has this pod, which is typical of guidance systems on military planes. So, you know, you just have to get to the point of a reasonable doubt where you say, okay, maybe the official story is true, but I'm not going to believe it until I find the time to look into everything Bill, Sean, and Bruce are talking about while I have to work two jobs to try to make a living in America anymore. Right. And I think it's also, it's difficult for people to wrap their mind around something <clears throat> as horrific as this being anything other than what we were told. You know, I think there even even what we were told is is horrific. The fact that there may have been collusion with our own government is well, yeah. I mean, this is a great string to pull to bring people down the rabbit hole that you guys have been down for years now. Of you know, there's there is no Santa Claus. It's a, the, our reality is so staged and phony from a, a government and from big institutions and from the media that it's it's a horrific awakening it's a horrific awakening yeah and some people can't you reminded up. me of another uh you know tremendous uh infamous quote by by our, our great bill and alan dulles he said you know we got the people working so much they don't care who jack ruby is wow i yeah. mean yeah Boy, what a what i a... mean and Jack, it's just alan dulles and i believe his brother john foster were in the room at the meeting in Germany in 1932-33 that negotiated Adolf Hitler to become chancellor, mm -hmm. representing their Wall Street clients right. who were so heavily invested in building up uh, Germany and then right. through the Nazi Absolutely. party. Yeah. Absolutely. Just that uh, Dulles is a disgusting human being. I mean, we, we bash him every episode, Billy, right? I yeah, mean, yeah, there's... Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. O but, Othello is a great play by Shakespeare. He was a noble ruler in love with his wife, and he had a, he had a, an advisor named Iago who poisoned him against his own wife, made Othello think that his wife Desdemona was cheating on him. So Othello strangles to death his own beautiful wife that he loved because of this evil, poisonous, 
Iago. He's a real Iago, says what that kind of character is. Alan Dulles is America's Iago. Absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. Bruce, you know, I got one more thing I want to discuss. Um, you know, like I said before, I I don't have the time to look into all these these things. And and 9-11 was one that I I didn't purposely go down the road that much. Um, another one that I didn't have the time, but I always want to look into uh was uh John F. Kennedy Jr. assassination. Have you looked into that yes. much? Yes. Okay. And there's a brand new book out. And uh, you're going to want to interview Damon Ize, I-S-E. Okay. JFK Jr. marked for death. Damon is a former pilot, flight instructor for years and years and years. And a number of years ago, he started looking into and he got all the and it, the transportation, the telemetry of the flight. And he puts together and proves I've had him on my show twice. There was a bomb on board at the tail, which sent the plane smack down into a heavy and fast nosedive and the book just came out and i believe it's only available right now through a website called the jfk assassination.com because he had contributors to the book author i think gary hill and somebody else damon is say ise jfk jr marked for death so how is he going to be Trump's running mate then if he's if he's dead? I thought he was alive and he's going to run with Trump in 2020. You're tired. It's late. You're confusing that with RFK Jr. <laughs> well, Bruce, the motive, the motive to take out JFK Jr. Was it more um, that he was he was thinking of a run down the line for president or was it that he was going to really do a deep dive into what happened to his father? Both. Or was it both? Both. I've seen, okay. I'm convinced, I've seen so many uh, reports from people who really looked into it. He was more and more vocal toward the end of his life that he was investigating and pursuing the real killers. And there's even folks who report a conversation that he that he had, John Jr., nailing Bush Sr., and in the last month of his life, more or less, he told John Jr. told someone, if W thinks he's going to be president, because this is 1999, remember, what I, well, I'm going to release stuff right. he couldn't get elected dog catcher. And wow. someone also, just anecdotally, someone else also reports talking to Hillary Clinton, who was thinking about running for Senate in New York. What would you do if Kennedy, John Jr., competes with you and she supposedly simply said he's not going to be a problem that's anecdotal i just love bringing them into the the villainous uh conversation <laughs> bill did i bust your balls right about you were confusing john jr with rfk jr you that's fine that's fine um <laughs> or were you making a joke who got confused you or me no, I think according to uh, to is it QAnon that, Q that not. Th yeah they say that uh, oh that, that's that the it. JFK Jr. is gonna is still alive, and that Trump's going to announce him as as his running mate in twenty twenty four. Thank you, I forgot so, about that. So that's that why, one. yeah, no, that's why I'm wondering. Uh, you know, Bruce, it, have you ever have you ever looked into the attempted assassination on Reagan? Yeah, enough to have a page or two about it in my book. And the the Bush family were friends with Hinkley. the Hinckley family back to the nineteen right. sixties, mm -hmm. you know. And I think they sacrificed the son, John Hinckley Jr., set him up as the as the patsy because there's a, there's plenty to indicate there was another shooter on the scene for Reagan. In one report, I'm not going to be certain about that. Maybe Hinckley pulled the trigger. I don't think so. But at least he was he was uh, he seemingly, in my opinion, the circumstantial evidence. Again, Your Honor, I I request an well, official investigation as to him being set up in order to get Bush in there as president in 1981. I've seen links. I mean, again, I haven't looked into this one as much as I want to, but um, I've seen links of Hinckley to to mind control program. So he, yeah, it's yeah. possible he was another Sirhan, or yeah. you know, even yeah. even Chapman, because we had David Whelan on. Yep. Uh, talking about the John Lennon and we're, we're going to have him back. So we're going to get more into yeah. that. And I, and notice how that was four months apart, John Lennon to uh Hinkley shooting Reagan and they do things in clusters. So it's not a mm -hmm. one-off. So subconsciously we think, Oh, these kind of things just happen, you know, check this out. 
Lone nut Marine Lee Harvey Oswald kills President Kennedy. Then in 64, 65, and into 66, articles all over the place. Wait a minute. This doesn't add up. This doesn't add up. This doesn't add up. Okay? July 1966, Inquest by Edward J. Epstein. Full book showing why. Wait a minute. The Warren Report's full of crap. Oswald couldn't have done it alone. August 1st, I think, 1966. Charles Whitman, lone nut Marine in Texas, goes up into the tower at the university, I think at Austin, and shoots 15 people and four or five of them died until he dies. Oh, lone nuts kill people in Texas. Mm -hmm. He also had all this evidence about being under mind control. He was an upright Marine. He was very liked and very, very intelligent. And his journals were filled the last few months of his life. This young Charles Whitman, former Marine, the shooter from the Texas tower, going to doctors. I don't know why I'm losing control of my mind and my memory and my emotions. I don't know why I'm having these anger issues. Oh, excuse me. On August 1st, before he went to the tower, he killed his wife and he killed his mother. And he left a note saying, I don't know why I killed them. And then he goes over there. Mind control, anybody? Wow. Yeah, we've been down this road before with the mind control. And it's, it's you know, a lot of people, unless you really do a deep dive, and we had, you know, Lisa Pease on several times, and she's, she's a, the, I, I think, the, the best expert on that. Um, and, and we're familiar with the mind control. It, it was disgusting, the, the experiments that were done. Yeah. Like she always tells me, there's, it's not just MK Ultra. There was dozens and dozens of mind control uh, yeah. the programs that that yeah. the intelligence community, you know, not just CIA, but the Navy intelligence were and military intelligence were running. Yeah. And I've learned under the wing of Chris Milligan, a trying day there. There are a lot of independent intelligence organizations, not just f- in governments right. all over the world for these giant corporations that are richer than many countries. So. it It's absolutely it's absolutely overwhelming. Now, if that doesn't inspire someone to spend 15 minutes trying to cultivate a spiritual imagination how else can we survive yeah well it's it's tough to pull people away from their phones and whatever else they're doing long enough to you know and it's listen these are these are challenging topics they're confusing um you know we've done episodes and i've said to sean I, I I don't understand. I don't, you know, you you say so many names. There's so many different things that happen. It's tough to keep it all straight. It's confusing. And Sean, you always say that's that's a black op. That's a nature yeah. of a black op. And that's that's a black op. These are these are created by very intelligent people. Yeah. I mean, the the CIA is run at the top by by Ivy League grads. I mean, these these are not, you know, people off the street that that they just handpicked. I mean, these these are very intelligent. You know, Harvard, I, Yale, Brown. Princeton. And I, ha- I have a big tangent in my 9-11 chapter about the CIA. They are so rich. They've been so breakaway and unaccountable. They've yep. got compartments that the leadership at the CIA, I bet, don't even know about. Oh, exactly. Definitely. So the public faces we know are, you know, Ivy League and very, very smart. But who knows who's running around in the shadows? Because, Bruce, we talked about when, when Kennedy fires Dulles and he puts John McCone in there. McCone didn't know half of the stuff that was going on. And Dulles was still running operations. He was still, he might have not had the title. He was still running the CIA. Yep. A- Angleton, Helms, all these guys were reporting to him. Yep. And McCone, his, didn't, his, know, his, McCone yeah. didn't know anything that was going on. Yeah. Yeah. In 62 and 63. His home in Georgetown was a revolving door of the same folks who were reporting to him and when he had his office at, at Langley. And recently, I think you guys even covered it. The um his diary, his day planner that was April, recently yep. found yep. that showed we the weekend of the assassination. He was uh, you know, there the farm. Mark, the farm, yeah. which is which was code for a CIA planning facility there in Virginia. Yep. Lovely. Yep. yep. Unbelievable. Hey, Bruce, this has been wonderful. Um, great conversation. And, you know, again, we we thank you for coming on. We thank you for having us on your show. I think, Sean, I can speak for both of us. It, it was probably the yeah, most it was nervous, awesome. It was the most nervous we've we've ever been since we've started this was, was going on your show. But we had a great time. We had a blast with you. Um, and and we thank you for, for having us on. Uh, thank you. And keep up the great work. You know, for months and months, I forget when I first found you guys. I really love when your new stuff drops. And I got a million questions for you about your Charles Manson series, but I'll let you guys go. It's always an honor and privilege. Get me back anytime you want. Come back on my show sooner than later. 
We and love the comeback that Bruce. Never quit. Never quit. And tell everyone you know, you have to look into this stuff. Right. You have to wake up so you are yep. not surprised when the hammer comes down. Literally, Bill and Sean, I would not be surprised because of the deaths and injuries. Oh, this is YouTube. This is going on. Yeah. YouTube and, and yeah, and podcasts. Uh, they'll put well, up some kind of, they'll put up a, they oh, they'll, put, put, yeah, up they'll a put up a disclaimer. We get them all the time now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, they put up the official story on Oswald on all yeah. our episodes. Well, there's a health situation that is so horrifying that I wouldn't be surprised for this amazing false flag to distract us from it. And where I was simply was going to make the point, hopefully humorous, this might be our last day with electricity because to distract us from their crimes they may say, oh, we've had a cyber attack from uh, Rolodex Korea. Yeah. And, and now we've got no Internet or electricity anymore. And we have to be able to whistle through the dumpster as we're looking for dinner. Hmm. Amazing stuff. Yeah. Uh, Amazing. Sean, do we have, do we have Bruce's book on, in our uh, in our bookstore? Um, I didn't see it to add there, Bruce. I was looking for it in our, our bookstore, but I, I'll keep looking for it to add. Okay. How we'll can I help you? How can I help get my book for sale in your bookstore? <laughs> well, we got to see what the inventory that we have. I mean, it, it's really, you know, out of our control, but let's see. Let me see what we can do. All right. And email me your addresses so I can gift you each a copy of my book because I want you to try to read it. Excellent. Thank Let's you. If Bruce. you haven't already, I'm assuming something here. I read I read part of it, Bruce. I read the experts from it and stuff. And then, you know, I definitely yeah. want to read it. I definitely want to read it. It's it's fascinating. Yeah. Whoever it's doesn't have it. You got my idea. interest. All right, good. So, it's, so it's only like 175 pages and then 45 pages of sources. It's awesome. All right. We'll definitely give that a read. Thank you, Bruce. Bruce the Torres, uh, God School, 9-11, and JFK, The Lies That Are Killing Us, and The Truth That Sets Us Free, and his TNT radio show world stage there you go world stage <laughs> thank you bruce we appreciate you joining us my thank pleasure you, have a great night thank you Sean. all right thank you thank you sir